The last video about my layout GPS sensor drew quite some interest and I received a lot of questions about some details of the system. So I decided to make this video to answer at least some of them. And to explain why I think a layout GPS system is worth investigating, I am going to show you how I solder track and feeder wires. Makes a lot of sense, right? Welcome to the IOTT channel, I am Hans Tanner. It seems that every model railroad channel on YouTube has at least one video showing how to solder track and feeder wires. I watched some of them and this is what seems to be state of the art. You remove any paint and oxidation from the side of the track, then heat the rail with a soldering iron and add some solder while holding the feeder wire with a tool like a third hand and solder it to the rail. To help the solder flow, many people add a generous portion of flux to the process. When done, you clean any residues, sometimes even from the top surface of the rail. Obviously, this is not an easy process and that's probably the reason that there are so many videos covering this topic. Chances are that the rail is not heated enough, resulting in a cold soldering point. As a result, the wire will lose contact and fall off after a while. If the solder joint is good, chances are that the heat applied to the rail also melted some of the ties. And sometimes the solder forms a little hump on top of the rail, which then has to be filed away, leaving some scratches in the surface of the rail, which over time will collect dust and oxidation and therefore reduce the current flow between rail and wheel and cause sparks when a locomotive is moving over the rail joint. So, it's complicated, difficult and the result often not very satisfactory. But as always on the IOTT channel, I am looking for a smarter and more innovative solution. So, let me show you an easier way to solder track and feeder wires. For a simple connection of two rails, it is sufficient to just put a small drop of soldering paste inside the rail joint before joining the two track segments. Then, I simply heat the rail joiner for a few seconds from the side or underneath until I see the paste turning silver. Then I let it cool off. Optionally, I may use a moist sponge to prevent any plastic ties from melting, that's all. For a track feeder wire, I take a file and cut open one side of the joiner. Then I file off the foot of the rail so that there is enough room for a feeder wire between the rails. As you see, I normally prefer solid wire for the last few inches and solder it to a larger feeder wire underneath the baseboard. Then the same process as before. Add a drop of solder paste into the joiner, push the feeder wire into it and push the two rails into position so that they touch each other. Now I simply heat the joint from the side or below until the solder paste starts shining and I'm done. If I did not deposit too much solder paste then there is not even a need to clean anything. So. Why do I talk about track soldering in a video that is supposed to further explain the layout GPS system shown in video number 82? Well, first because I think it is a topic you are interested in. And second, because to me it is an example for how little innovation there is in our hobby. Solder paste has been around since surface mount technology became state of the art in electronics manufacturing, which was in the early 80s of the last century, so roughly 40 years ago. And despite that, I am not aware of any video on YouTube that would suggest applying it to the track soldering problem, which is amazing given the fact that it makes the task so much easier. And that is my point. Not only for track soldering, but even more so for layout control and train electronics. There are plenty of new technologies available and we never considered to use them for our trains. And quite often this technology that by now is widely used in cell phones and cars, which pretty much goes hand in hand with availability and low prices. We just need to look around and creatively apply what we find 
to our train layouts and that, I guess, is an important part of what I try to do in the IOTT channel. And with that, back to the topic of the video, which is some background information to the layout GPS idea, which also is sort of an innovative concept. To get started, let me be very clear about one thing. Compared to localization and navigation of a car or an airplane, knowing where a train is on a layout is a rather trivial problem, because we can safely assume that the train is actually on a track. Yes, off-track situations are possible, but not part of regular operation, so we do not plan for it. Now, the fact that trains are sitting on the track reduces the localization problem to a one-dimensional problem. Yes, the track can have curves, but if we know what distance a train traveled from a knowing start point, we know exactly where it is. So, all we need is a method to measure the travel distance and have some trigger points to calibrate the measurement from time to time. This is normally done using a combination of sensors on the layout and some software that has a model of how the various track sections are connected so that it can update the train position as messages from the sensors are received. For example, to make a train gradually slow down and stop in front of a signal, there are two common approaches to do that. Both require a track section in front of the signal that is equipped with a sensor that can detect if a train enters that block. A common solution is a current sensor that at the same time acts as block occupancy detector. Another possibility is a light barrier at the entry point to the block. Slowing down and stopping can now happen in two ways. The first is to estimate the travel distance from the trigger point by integrating the current speed of the locomotive over time, slow it down and stop it when the desired distance to the signal is reached. This requires a locomotive-specific speed table, so the software knows how fast the locomotive is going on which speed step. To keep this ratio independent of the load, locomotives with back EMF decoders are of course preferable, but when done properly, trains will stop at the desired location with only small tolerance. The second possibility is to gradually slow down the train to a minimum speed and then proceed with minimum speed until a second sensor is reached that tells the control software to stop the train immediately. The second sensor is typically a momentary sensor such as a light barrier, RFID or barcode reader, or even a simple read switch. So, of course, now you ask, if it is that simple, why would we then ever need something like the layout GPS from the last video? Glad you asked. See, the problem is not knowing where the trains are once the layout is up and running. The real problem is setting up the system to make it running. In the example we just looked at, the control software first needs to know the details about the track section the train is entering. This includes the type and addresses of sensors that are providing the feedback. Then the address and type of the signal the train reaches at the end of the block, along with the current aspect that is displayed. Then it should be known what distance there is from entering the block to the signal at the other end. If a speed integration function is used to slow down the train, the speed characteristics of the locomotive needs to be known as well. If the track is to be used in both directions, the same data must be configured for a train move in the other direction as well. And then the process repeats for every block on the layout. On top of this, the blocks also need to be logically connected so that the software always knows what track section comes next as the train travels over the layout. So, you can see, already for a medium-sized layout, this tends to become a lot of data that needs to be entered and if you ever try to set up layout automation in any of the typical train software packages, you know how many configuration screens need to be mastered in order to do so, and therefore some sort of automation of the setup process would be very beneficial. 
The most obvious way to simplify the configuration would be importing the track data from a layout CAD software. This would allow to automatically set up the block system and maybe even set all block detector turnout and signal addresses automatically, depending on the kind of data that is available in the CAD track plan. Unfortunately, there are some hurdles to this approach. First, I am not aware of many train controller programs that offer sophisticated functions to import layout data from a track planning software. And if so, then only for a specific data format available in one particular CAD program. And that's the second problem. Each CAD program pretty much uses its own proprietary data format. And in most cases, the data structure is not documented so that it would be easily possible to write an import function. The other problem is we do not necessarily want to use CAD programs to design a layout. Maybe not even for our main home layout, but for sure not to set up, for example, an ad hoc layout or a weekend train show setup of a modular layout. In those cases, we would prefer a method where the layout could be set up and then, so to speak, measured as built and the data imported into the train control software. And that is the basic idea behind my layout GPS to put a sensor on a train and then measure the track geometry while traveling the track, add sensor turnout and signal addresses and then use the data to configure layout automation in the train control software. Unfortunately, this is way more complicated to do than just identifying the position of a train on a known track. Now we have to measure where the track actually is. So we need to be able to localize the sensor within an XYZ coordinate system, the size of the layout. And since the sensor is mounted on a moving train, we can determine the track location from the position data. Now there are several ways to do that, all with some specific advantages and disadvantages. So we should spend a moment to think about what system characteristics we are looking for. Here is what I think is important. The sensor should generate 3D track geometry data, optionally identify turnout locations, block boundaries and block addresses. The precision should be in the millimeter range, particularly for smaller scales. It must be possible to clearly distinguish individual tracks, for example, in a hidden yard. I am looking for simple installation, setup and use, which means as few as possible devices and a simple user interface. It should work for indoor and outdoor, ideally using the same components. It should be usable with all major scales, so N, H, O and G at least. It should have what I call hobby compatible prices. It should facilitate or automate the system setup and it should facilitate or automate the layout operation if the control software has an import function with a documented interface. Of course, this also requires an open data format. After releasing video number 82, I received several reactions from people pointing to existing systems that apparently have the same purpose in mind. In the next few minutes, I therefore will do a quick review of some other systems and explain how they work so that we can evaluate how well they meet the requirements. After that, I will discuss a few details of the IMU-based approach from video number 82 and explain where I see the specific strengths of this approach. As mentioned in video number 82, my first idea was actually to use the available satellite-based navigation systems, normally referred to as GPS. Over the last two decades or so, there was a lot of development in that area. GPS is not the only system anymore, there are competing systems from China, Russia, the European Union, India and Japan. The last two are only available in the Pacific region, the others are worldwide and modern GPS chips 
typically support more than one system. Furthermore, there is an add-on technology called RTK or real-time kinematics that allows for achieving an accuracy of just a few millimeters. So the main goal of measuring the track location could be achieved, but unfortunately only outdoors. Furthermore, the RTK technology is expensive, somewhere around $300 per receiver, so it is not hobby budget friendly. Another technology I looked into is triangulation. This approach uses three stations of known location and measures the angle under which the sensor is seen from each station. By combining the three different views along with the known distance between the stations, the exact position of the sensor can be determined. There is a variety of measuring techniques to determine either distance or angle between the stations and the sensor, either based on radio waves, light or laser beams, or even sound waves. A major driver is asset localization in areas where the GPS signal does not work, in other words, indoors. The idea is to use existing infrastructure like for example Wi-Fi routers as base stations with known location and then determine the exact location of mobile devices carrying a receiver chip using time of flight based triangulation. The technology exists already, but the current accuracy is in the range of feet, not millimeters like I am looking for. However, in the long run and with new chip generations, I think localization will become a standard Wi-Fi feature in the future. Time of flight based triangulation systems already work well with sound waves though, which are traveling relatively slow and measuring the travel time is easy. There is even a commercial system for indoor localization available that is also advertised for its use on model railroads. The brand name is Games on Track and it has been around for a while. In a more recent development it seems the company now also tries to sell the system under the brand name Got Position for industrial applications and indoor localization. Using triangulation it of course offers a real-time full 3D fix with an accuracy of a few millimeters and no surprise it also can be used for the navigation of indoor drones. According to the technical documentation the satellites that receive the signal should be about 5 to 10 meters apart but in larger rooms more satellites can be added. Outdoor use is not recommended though. In their webshop Games on Track offer an HO starter kit with position sender and three satellites along with a DCC booster and a turnout decoder for about $900, which is not exactly cheap. From a viewer I received a link to an interesting system that uses a completely different technology. It is called Rail Magic and it is using an innovative approach I have never seen before. It works with a number of permanent magnets that can be mounted underneath the layout spaceboard. The magnets need to be placed on the side of the track with a distance of about 4 cm from the center line and one magnet about every 20 to 100 cm. This magnet placing recommendation already makes it clear that the system is primarily intended for indoor HO scale layouts. And scale might work as well, but I really have a hard time to imagine placing magnets along the tracks of my garden railroad. The combined effect of all these magnets is a weak magnetic field with unique strength and orientation at every location of the layout. The locomotives are then equipped with a hall sensor that measures the strength and orientation of the field and reports it back to the control device. The control device then uses a pattern analysis algorithm to interpret the measured magnetic field and to determine the location. The stated promise of the system is simplicity and what they mean by that is primarily the elimination of isolated track sections and block detectors and replace them with position trackers in each locomotive. Real-time positioning down to the millimeter level 
seems to be possible. So this system makes things simpler by eliminating a lot of block wiring and track feeders. But unfortunately, it does not help at all with what I identified as the main problem, system setup and configuration. This becomes very clear when watching some of the how-to videos on the RailMagic webpage. First, each locomotive with a tracking device needs to be calibrated. And to set up the layout geometry, a software called Layout Designer is to be used to define the blocks on screen and enter the length of every block. The track graphics certainly help, but watching the videos, I get the impression that setup is still a quite time-consuming task. The key problem is that the system is not capable of building a geometry model of the track based on the magnetic feedback. There is no absolute positioning in a 3D coordinate system. Therefore, this information has to be entered manually. From a pricing point of view, the system is quite reasonable. It only needs one control device and a tracker, which is in the price range of a DCC decoder for every locomotive. The company also claims to provide combined tracker decoder devices in the future, which will further reduce the total system cost. So that's what I have learned so far about other systems featuring some sort of train localization in 3D space. If you know about any other manufacturers or technologies that are out there, please let me know in the comments section of this video. To finish up, let me explain some more how my IMU-based sensor works and why I think it is the most suitable approach so far. An IMU basically delivers two sets of data. The first set from the gyroscopes provides position information in relation to an external 3D coordinate system, so the typical yaw, roll and pitch as we know it from aircraft navigation. The second set is accelerometer data in all three dimensions, indicating in what direction the IMU chip is accelerated. Theoretically, it would be possible to integrate acceleration data over time to get the current speed and then integrate the speed data over time to get the position. Unfortunately, this approach does not work in reality because the integration errors add up with each iteration and only after a few seconds the estimates are ways off from reality. In fact, when reading scientific papers, it seems to be widely accepted that IMU data cannot be directly used for localization because of the integration errors. That's the reason why for my layout GPS sensor I combined the heading data from the IMU with the data from the magnetic distance sensor I introduced in video number 81. This sensor has a resolution of 720 increments per axle revolution, so even for a large size G-scale wheel with a diameter of more than 30 mm, this results in one increment for every 0.125 mm, and for smaller scales it is even better. In combination with the heading vector from the IMU, it is possible to estimate the current position of the sensor within the 3D coordinate system with an accuracy of just a few millimeters, as I have demonstrated in video number 82 on a 200 feet long garden railway track. With smaller scales, the measuring errors are proportionally reduced, so I expect the same relative precision for HO and N scale as well. Talking about smaller scales, I am currently working on putting the sensor in an HO car, which seems not to be a big challenge. And I am confident that the size can even be reduced to make it fit in some N scale equipment with just using regular hobbyist tools. I certainly will try it out and if you want to see the results, I suggest you subscribe for the IOTT channel and hit the bell icon so that you are in a premium seat when new videos become available. Furthermore, the sensor works the same way indoors and outdoors and does not need additional infrastructure like triangulation satellites or localization magnets. The cost of one sensor board is in the area of maybe $40 if I do a nice PCB for it.
The IMU and the magnetic sensors itself are in the area of about $5 to $10 a piece, so overall costs are what I call hobby compatible. Here is my comparison of the IMU sensor with the other technologies I introduced in this video. My conclusion certainly is that IMU is the way to go. In the last couple of weeks I have further refined the sensor software, so let me show you the new features. In the setup part I have added a drop-down box for scale selection. This information is needed to do a conversion of the technical speed as measured by the sensor to a scale equivalent speed display. In the results section I have reorganized the display a little bit and added a field for scale speed in kilometers per hour. And the other thing that is new is a field that displays the radius of the curve the train is traveling through at the moment. Of course it shows straight if it currently is not going through a curve. Let me do a quick demonstration. I accelerate the train and it starts moving. I am going relatively slow as the computer display is updated only once per second and I want to have a smooth screen display of the curve for this demonstration. On the controller the position is reported 100 times per second, so the speed could be much higher without losing quality of the measured position. We see the train moving and the technical speed in millimeters per second. In the next fields the scale speed and travel distance are shown as well. As soon as the sensor enters the curve, the experienced radius is reported. The track is LGB sectional track with a nominal radius of 600 mm and I get a result of somewhere between 550 and 620 or so mm. Quite good. At the end of the curve the train enters the siding and we can see the radius change from minus 600 to a brief positive 600 to ind indicate the counter curve that leads to the parallel siding. And as soon as the train is on the siding the radius display changes to straight. Also noteworthy the change of the heading information which changed of course from zero to around 180 degrees as the train traveled along the curve. And you can also see real-time updates for the position information in all three dimensions. The next step now is to work on a web app that allows to take the raw data from the sensor, add information about turnouts, signals and block detectors and then create configuration data that can be used to configure train control software. We will see how this goes and I certainly will keep you updated. And that's it for this video. I hope it was useful or at least interesting for you and you now have a better idea how this layout GPS works and how it can help to make the configuration of a train control software a breeze. If so, please click the like button below to let me know. Doing so also helps to promote this video and the IOTT channel in general as more likes cause YouTube to suggest this video to many more potential viewers. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.